Now, I know you've had a wonderful morning of theory and science, which has been fantastic, and what I'm planning to do now is take you through more practical aspects. In fact, my slides, I don't think, even have any words except for the first one. They're all pictures. We're just going to discuss how to feed a family, how to make it work, how to make all of the science that we've learned work for you, for your kids, for whoever's keto or not keto in your family. So I know a lot of you are fully into keto. We've got, I think, 15 ketones of 15 up there somewhere, which is incredible. But there's also quite a few people here who are just starting on their keto journey or possibly here today to find out where there is something that they want to do. So I'm hoping that you keto gurus out there will get some tips and tricks, but I am gearing this towards more of the new people trying to start or trying to work out how to, you know, if you're keto and your partner's not or if the kids are not and how to make it work for everyone. So a little bit about myself. I have a slightly different background to your previous presenters. Uh, my, my background's in exercise science and sports nutrition. At the moment, I do uh, some nutrition work and a lot of also Pilates and functional training. I'm one, on the editorial team for Oxygen magazine, so I write for them. I was the lead host and creative director of Aerobics Oz Style for years, I know, seven years. Um, my hardest job, but my most fulfilling, is the fact that I'm a mum of three. I have an eight-year-old, a six-year-old, and a three-year-old, who are all low-carb. They just don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> How did I end up keto? So I've been low-carb for probably 15 years. When I was doing my postgrad in nutrition, I was totally disillusioned with what I was learning. It didn't make sense to me. It didn't resonate with me. So I started looking for other areas to study. And there wasn't that much. I did my metabolic typing training through America, which was incredible, and I have to say, probably really started me off on this journey. That's when I started really dropping my carbs down and got rid of, I didn't go high fat at that stage, but I definitely got rid of anything that was low fat. So got rid of all my low fat dairy, bumped everything right up, um, and changed, changed how I looked at food. But I've been low carb, high fat now for about three years. So what I want to share with you guys today is just the practical aspects of making this work. I obviously cook a lot because I think when you are eating this way, you need to know what's going into your food. You don't want to buy prepackaged stuff. I can't say I enjoy it, but I do it. So I try and make it as efficient as possible and make it so that I can make one meal that works for the kids, for Duran, for me, and we can all we can all make it work together. So we're going to do a day in my keto life. So to start off, breakfast. If you get a double yolk, then you get to make a wish, according to my eight-year-old. For me, breakfast is really easy because I'm usually trying to do an intermittent fast. I do that probably three days a week. So I'll stop uh, eating at about 6 o'clock. I have dinner with the kids, nice and early. 6, 6.30, we're done. And I often won't eat again until maybe between 11 and 12 when I finish my first clients in the morning. The best thing about that is it gives me extra time for child wrangling, because I'm not worried about my food. The kids. I think, especially in the mornings for mums, one of the hardest things is, oh my God, I've got to get the kids out the door, it's a rush, and so the best options seem to be cereal and toast. But it doesn't need to be. It takes five minutes to scramble eggs, to fry eggs. Eggs are my go-to for everything. So that's probably the easiest option. And, and if you do need something super quick, what I often do is I do frittatas the night before, boiled eggs the night before, they're in the fridge, and if we have to run out the door, they're ready to go. We had a couple of questions, which is when we were walking around, Fiona and I, just saying, what do you guys eat for breakfast? And I think one of the things that people tend to forget, that's probably the easiest option, is dinner. Dinner for breakfast. My six-year-old, I think she, because she hasn't been programmed into what breakfast foods are, will often have a bowl of bolognese. She will have some meat casserole. And that's what she will ask me for for breakfast. So that's a super easy option. And it's, sometimes if, it's, if you're used to traditional breakfast foods, it takes a while to get your head around it, to think, oh my god, I'm going to get up and eat meat. But it doesn't take long for your body to get used to it. So it's actually a super, super easy option. The other thing I do, which um, I call it a parfait, because the girls like this really fancy name, and it's a bowl of yogurt, full fat, organic, like good quality yogurt, and I just chuck berries, nuts, 
desiccated coconut, make it look really pretty. <coughs> put, it, put their initials in it, whatever. Good to go, super quick. Um, the other thing is salmon patties, another really good dinner thing that we do for breakfasts. So if you start thinking about when you're making dinner, sometimes you need to tweak things and, so that it's doable for breakfast, but it's always, always a good option. And school lunches. So this is where I get a lot of questions because school lunches tend to be sandwiches. That's what everybody seems to assume a school lunch needs to be. But my best discovery has been these bento style lunch boxes. And they're not just for kids. There's small ones, medium ones, and big ones for the big kids. So if you are gonna be packing your lunches, so I am talking about kids' lunches, but feel free to transfer this onto your own lunches. You don't have to get the superhero and fairy boxes. But what this does is it gives you a whole lot of different compartments. And then you can go, okay, so what I need is my low carb veggie. So I throw in the cucumbers, I'll do tomatoes, I'll do olives, which are great for the kids. Then my second thing is, okay, they need their protein. It's not in these pictures, because I tend to give it to them in a slightly separate container. And I'll do, whether it's roast beef or chicken or eggs, whatever their good source of protein is going to be. And then you go, okay, fats. How am I going to get the fats into the lunchbox? Almost every day, I'll give them some form of avocado, whether it's mashed avocado to dip their veggies in, whether it's chunks of avocado and tomato, I'll get a big dose of avocado. Um, and I'll give them a wedge of butter. And my kids will eat that wedge of butter like cheese. Not everybody I know can do that. But somehow they manage to finish, I don't know how else they eat it, but they finish that wedge of butter that's in their lunchbox. So they do sometimes want a sandwich. Mum, today please, can we have a sandwich? And the option is, I, there is a really good protein bread that I found out there. It does have a lot of seeds in it. So those of you that are being overly cautious with your omega-3 to omega-6 ratio, Paul's going to look daggers at me. It does have seeds, but it's a good option um, because it is very low in carb and it's got a decent amount of fat in it. And I'll use that bread or they get half a sandwich. That's it, with a lot of butter in it. So my kids are low carb. They're not keto. They're not, you know, my, under 20 grams. So it's just a matter of juggling proportions, making it work. When you go shopping, so the kids are at school, I'm going to the shops. The big farmers markets are amazing and you can get a lot of really good organic grass-fed, grass-finished meats and dairy and one of the things I like about that is you can often speak to the farmers and you can find out because obviously we, we've been discussing grass-fed but there's also a difference between grass-fed and grass-finished. These farmers are sneaky sometimes and they will say grass-fed, and they are grass-fed, but then just before the meat goes to slaughter, they bump them up with grains. So it gives you a chance to actually find out what you're buying. But I'm going to assume that most people on most days are shopping at the supermarket. If you are shopping at the supermarket, you never really need to go down the aisles. Or very, there might be one aisle you actually need to go down. You're looking at working the periphery, because everything you need to get should be around the outside. You're looking at your veggies or your broccoli and your kale and your nice low starchy veggies. Um, your grass fed, I know it's not that easy to get grass finished and sometimes not grass fed meat at the supermarket, but you have to look for it. And they almost always have organic. I know Coles, um, Aldi, there's a lot of places that do sell really good organic uh, meats. So that's what you're looking around the periphery for. Your dairy, so your creams, your butters, your cheeses, your yogurts. So you might need to go down an aisle to get your eggs and maybe your tins of tuna and tins of salmon if you need that. And then you're looking at getting your oil, so your coconut oil and your olive oil. But there is very little packaged food that you need to. There's no packaged food you need to get, so you just work the outside. Afternoon snacks. So I pick the kids up from school, and the first thing they say, no matter how much fat I've put in their lunch boxes, they get in the car, what did you bring to eat, Mum? And the first thing I say to them is, get your lunchbox out and finish what's in your lunchbox. And they hate me. They do it, because they don't get anything else otherwise. But for me, a massive go-to, and this applies to everybody for an afternoon snack, so it's not just kids. I make them and I bring for me, is nuts. That's a brilliant snack for the kids. I give them nuts. Those are photo of Duran's cheese chips. They are probably our, one of our best discoveries recently. It's literally just grated parmesan on baking paper in the oven, and it comes out as a crunchy chip. And so it's, it's parmesan cheese, that's it. And you can use it as, to dip things, you can use it as replacement of a cracker, I use that a lot. 
Um, and my other fabulous discovery is what I tell the kids is fudge, but it's essentially a fat bomb. So I blend macadamia, <laughs> almond, desiccated coconut, coconut oil, raw cacao and vanilla when I'm making it for us. When I make it for the kids, I will put a little bit of honey just to kind of take that really intense cacao edge off and they inhale that. And that's a massive amount of fat. So I know if you're running to whatever activity, they're getting their good fats, they're getting some protein and they're good to go till dinner. So cooking and food prep. So one of the things with being keto, we, it, I think it's incredibly important to be prepared because it's not like you can just be out and go, I'm just gonna grab a snack because you're gonna end up with a sandwich or some bar or, you know, so you want to make sure that you've, you've got stuff that you can take with you when you go out, whether it's, you know, just nuts or something like that. But if you have time on a weekend to do some food prep, make the cheese chips, make the fat bombs, do a big slow cooker, because that's a great thing, especially in winter, to take with you to work. Um, so that is definitely a worthwhile habit of getting into on your weekends. But the other thing is making meals work for everyone. So... The whole thing, why is this not going down? The whole, the whole thing that I wanted to kind of get across to everybody is that, yes, my kids are low carb, but they will still maybe want pasta. So your kids might not be low carb at all. You might have one person who is keto who isn't. So you make a big batch of bolognese, which you will use non-bought sources. You just chuck in you know, a tomato passata and a tomato paste so you know you're not getting anything, any added sugar that you don't know about. And there's a million ways that you can make that work. So I'll do a whole lot of zoodles. Everyone know what zoodles are? My zucchini noodles. So with a spiralizer, and that's what the adults will have. We'll have zucchini noodles. My six-year-old will usually have that. And the other two will have, in my house, it's bolognese pasta, not pasta bolognese, because they'll get their bolognese and they get a little bit of pasta on top. So we reverse it, but they still think they're getting their pasta bolognese. We also do a really good eggplant lasagna with the bolognese. There's a million ways to make it work. So things like food swaps. If you want to transition people into it, if it's something you want to, you still want to eat your usual food, but you want to try and find a way to switch it to low carb, you're going to make cauliflower your best friend because cauliflower can become anything, I've discovered. So rice, we do collie rice. Mashed potato, we do collie mash. There's pizza base, which you use cauliflower and cheese, and they all actually come out amazingly well, and there's millions of recipes online for all of these as well. Just things like whitefish, switching them over to things that are higher in fat, like salmons and salmon and sardines, and I'm not saying don't eat whitefish, I love whitefish, but I will have it maybe you know, once in a while as opposed to the fattier fish. And same thing, if you can get the wild caught, you're doing better. Um, getting rid of margarines, adding in the butters. We spoke, Paul spoken uh, a lot about the seed oils. So getting rid of your seed oils, using your coconut and olive oils. Bread, ideally getting rid of all together. But if you need that stopgap, you've got the protein bread. Noodles to zoodles. And breadcrumbs, I use a mix of almond meal and desiccated coconut, and it works incredibly well. I do schnitzels, I do fish fingers. And the same thing, I'll make it, sometimes the kids will go, Mum, we don't want your schnitzel, we want real schnitzel. So I'll do half and half, and they'll each get, like, you know, one of each. And then they're trying to work out which one's which. <laughs> and that's the thing I was just discussing before, working proportions. This is especially important for when you are transitioning and trying to change your ratios um, and for the kids. So that would be a spaghetti bolognese, and that would be the bolognese spaghetti in my house. So just trying to keep things the same but adapt the ratios until people get used to it. So I do the same thing, like, with a shepherd's pie. We'll do a massive layer of really good bolognese, and then on the top, instead of potato, for the kids I'll often do a sweet potato layer, and then cheese, and we'll have a layer of collie mash on the top instead. So same meal, just reworked. Um, the other thing as well is with fruit. My kids still obviously want some fruit, and every once in a while they will. They'll give them you know, a piece of mango, I'll give them you know, an, an apple, but I try and give them berries, that's my main thing. And for school, I'll often give them some strawberries, some raspberries. But most of the time, what I'll try and do with it is give them a tub of yogurt, full fat yogurt, or their favorite is cream. And then they can chuck the berries into the cream, and at least they're going to be getting a good dose of fat with it. Cheats and treats. My biggest cheat, which works for everything, and 
my eight-year-old will tell you everything tastes better with butter and cream, and she's right, is that I will just add butter and cream to as much of everything as I can. We do veggies, we cover them in butter. If we, she still likes to have porridge, which I will let her have once in a while. She gets porridge made with full cream milk and with a massive amount of butter and cream in it. So there's a South African food um, breakfast called a toad in the hole. I don't know if you, anyone knows what I'm talking about. It's a piece of bread where you take out the middle and you fry it up with a fried egg in it. And I'll do that so that it's such a big hole that she's just left with the crust and a massive fried egg in the middle and that's her toad in the hole and she loves it. Um, so treats. So for me, alcohol I'm not interested in, but I don't want to live without chocolate. I'm willing to give up anything, but I need to find a way to make chocolate work for me. So there has to be a way in my family. Duron does a killer chocolate mousse, which is 85 to 90% chocolate. It's eggs, it's cream and butter. And it's unbelievable. If we have people coming over who are not keto, we might do it 70% so we don't scare them. <laughs> but, you know, you, you, you work with who you've got. The fudge, the fat bombs that I mentioned before, are, are amazing. And then it's dark chocolate, getting your body used to not having milk chocolate, working towards 70%, working towards 85%, working towards 90%, and I've discovered a 99%, which is incredible. But you've got to get used to it. And just one more thing is also, I know one of the questions we always get asked is, is eating out and working in a restaurant in menu, with menus and trying to navigate that and find how to make that work for you. So the easiest thing to think of, okay, in most restaurants, most of the sauces and the dressings are going to have some form of hidden sugar in it. So without fail, I will always order those on the side. You can trust yourself maybe to taste it and see, because if you are keto adapted, you'll know if it's sweet, but otherwise, the easiest thing is to order some, like we did here, some lemon and some olive oil and you're safe. Or in, in any type of restaurant you go to, you can usually find some form of protein and you can order some form of either salad or veggies and you get your olive oil on the side. When they bring the butter and the bread around, you say, no bread, thank you, please can I have two butters? And they look at you like you're crazy, but you keep the butter and you add that, you put that on top of your steak or whatever it is that you're eating. And there's a lot of places now that I'm seeing more and more of things like naked burgers. There's obviously much more of a demand for it. So if you ask for the burger without the bun, people tend to understand what you're doing now. It's less, it's less of a crazy thing. 15 years ago, people looked at me like I was mad. I get less of those looks. The best advice I can give to people who are starting out is just take baby steps. Do the initial thing of eliminating all the obvious sugars, the soft drinks, the lollies, Get rid of the bread, the pastas, the rice. Then you eliminate all the other grains. So you just work as you go. You eliminate your starchy veggies. You take it in a step-by-step -step process. You start to increase all your good fats, get rid of the bad fats. You increase your salt, which has been discussed. You look for your grass-finished fatty cuts of meat. And then you find easy recipes and things that work for you. So I know there are people who are all or nothing. If you want to go straight to number eight and just do it all in one go, that's awesome, but if you need to work it into your lifestyle, there are ways to do it and a lot of resources. Thank you so much.